afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Etta Heber, the Executive Director of the Center for Jewish Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, Life and Citations, Biblical Narratives and Contemporary Hebrew Culture, with Professors Ruth Sofar from the University of Michigan, Naomi Seidman from the University of Toronto, and Hannah Kronfield from the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you all from near and far for joining us today. The program today, we're going to hear first, first from the author, Ruth Sofar, will do a presentation on her work, and then she will be in conversation with Naomi and Hannah um, for an interesting dialogue and discussion. Um, you are welcome to ask questions today, but we ask that you please use the Q&A for questions. We will not be using the chat option. I'd also really like to thank our co-sponsors today, the Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies and the Greater Theological Union. And also particular thanks to Rebecca Goldberg and Maya Shemtov for helping to co-facilitate today's session. Um, please be sure and check out the, our website, jewishstudies.berkeley.edu for upcoming programs after today's really exciting program. We have a variety of interesting topics scheduled for the spring semester, which will begin in February. So now I'd really like to turn it over to our esteemed professor of comparative literature and Near Eastern studies, Hannah Kronfeld, who will introduce um, our guest speaker, Ruth Tofar, and then Naomi will introduce herself and we'll have Ruth begin. Thank you. Hannah? Thank you. Thank you very much, Etta, and thank you to um, uh, Rebecca Goldberg and Maya, Bos Maya Shemtov. <laughs> I'm getting my Mayas confused. Um, and to the three co-sponsors of this wonderful event. Um, I want to welcome Ruth uh, Tsofar, Professor Tsofar, back to Berkeley. And um, I'm sorry, this is only a virtual homecoming. Oti is Professor of Comparative Literature and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of Michigan and Faculty Associate in the Frankel Institute for Advanced Studies at Michigan. Oti received her PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Studies here in Berkeley um, and has been teaching at the University of Michigan for quite a few years now after a short stint at Utah. Um, she is the author of The Stains of Culture and Ethno Reading of Karaite Jewish, Jewish Women, a book that was awarded the Eli Congas Miranda Prize and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. Um, this, is, this was based on her dissertation research, which if I remember correctly, um, was uh, based also on work with the Karaite community here in the Bay Area, at least in part. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ruti. Okay. Um, her early work on Israel, Israeli ethnicity focused on the intersection of body, gender, and poetry. And as we'll see, that is still very much uh, the core of her work. Um, very interesting, uh, a very interesting part of it was published in Hagal in two complementary studies, The Body That Crumbled, Mizrahi Men Writing Poetic Anatomy and dissected identity, Mizrahi women, space and body. Other studies include her terrific work on the poetry of Yona Volach, some of the best studies of Volach ever written, especially um, the totally uh, eye-opening interpretation of the controversial poem uh, Tfilin by Volach, which caused the Sheilta, a, que a query in the Knesset. Uh, her future projects, tell me if he, they have changed since, uh, include the ethnographic study of the conversion of Jamusin, a Palestinian neighborhood in Tel Aviv, uh, to Givat Amal, which was populated by Jewish immigrants of Middle Eastern origin, and more recently to the luxurious Akirov Towers in Tel Aviv. Um, we're very happy to welcome you today, Ruth, to discuss your fascinating new book, Life in Citations, Biblical Narratives and Contemporary Hebrew Culture, 
רות סופר, בבקשה. Thank you. It, Nami, are you going next? Um, I, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Nomi Seidman. I teach at the University of Toronto. I'm supposed to be in Michigan this year. And it's one of the disappointments about being on Zoom is that I'm not hanging out with you in Ann Arbor, uh, Ruti. But I think my claim to fame in this particular um, setting is that you, uh, Ruti and I were um, dissertation chavrutot. Um, and exchange chapters with each other. And the stains of culture was how I learned what it meant to write a dissertation. So it's so wonderful to see not, not just that book, but this book, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. And I'm so excited at how many people are there, are here um, with us, including some old friends and some new friends. Um, I'll see you after your talk. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't see you too. Okay, I'll see you later. Ruti Bevakasha. Thank you, thank you, Hana, thank you, uh, Nomi. Um, good evening and good afternoon to you, friends, colleagues, and family members. I want to thank you, Hana, my teacher. You taught me new ways of reading. I should also thank Nomi. And yeah, the Chavuta was a very constitutive um, practice uh, in our uh, graduate school. And thank you also for initiating this event, Nomi. The fear of, of us coming together here is quite emotional for me. I also want to thank the three uh, co-sponsored as Etta suggested and to thank Etta specifically, Rebecca Goldberg and Shemtov, Maya Shemtov, but also Etta for working the technological magic of convene, to convene this webinar. I dedicate the talk to my brother-in-law, Yaakov Englard, who passed away last Saturday. He was a brother to me, a dear friend to many, a Yeke, German Jew who spoke Iraqi Arabic with my mother. He loved languages. Not just easily engage in conversation, he would take a walk with your mind, asking, reflecting, and at the end, leaving you with the feeling that he continues to think, generating question until the next time. He was a loving person, full of courage, truth, and brilliant humor. He will be sorely missed. Since the publication of my book in November 2019, a year ago, everything seems ever more extreme, more urgent, and less fathomable. Working with liter literature today, we know it is definitely not a good time for subtleties. In fact, I find myself within me a desire to raise the volume of my ideas, as well as those of poets, writer, and artist. Haven't they articulated the danger that now confront us in sufficiently endless ways? The nagging question remains the same, relevant to this talk. How do we make sense of the political disarray of reading? How do we redeem ourselves from the weight of the narrative then condition our existence. Based on the literary, my literary corpus, I focus on four fundamental biblical narratives. The 12 spies, the imagined body, the imagine, imaged milk and honey and the devouring land, the sacrifice of Isaac, the narrative of Sarai, Hagar and Ishmael in Genesis 16, and the story of Ruth. I augment my analysis with ample responses to these narratives in literary text, films, and artwork by multi-generational, ethnically and culturally diverse group of authors and artists, both canonic and still awaiting inclusion. These include Micha Naaman, Dan Pagis, Avram Shlonsky, Shelly El Kayam, Albert Suisa, Shoshana Shababo, Eli Bachar, as well as Palestinians authors such as Anton Shamas and Elias Khoury. These responses speak in various ways to the conundrum of existing within of the over-saturated textual landscape of biblical references and its imposition. My research shows a cohesive force of the Bible, not only early in the establishment of Israel, but in contemporary culture, years after the ethos of the melting pot. Grasping the degree and intensity of the Hebrew reader's fascination with the Bible and the close proximity of Israeli life to it, 
my work has slowly become a study of citation and citated citationality, or as Hannah Kornfeld wisely suggested, citationitis. Citated follows the Hebrew name like citationitis, conversion, naming conversion given to diseases, so citated. It is based on the profound identification that develops in Hebrew reader, both with its protagonist and biblical land itself, from the reader's proximity to biblicality. Even for a secular subject, the Bible and its weight are inescapable. Edmond Jabez, the Egyptian poet, helped me frame my discussion. In his poem, Adam and the Birth of Anxiety, he writes, and God created Adam. He created him a man, deprived from, the, from he, deprived him, depriving him of memory. Man without childhood, without past, without tears, without laughter or smiles. Man came out of came out of nothing, unable to claim even a portion of this nothing. Jabez Adam is born at the beginning into the book, and from nothing and from nothing. This being the beginning of all beginning, there is literally nothing to remember. A deprived Adam who is born out of nothing articulates the deep anxiety behind the desire to respond to the godly creation where textual Genesis and textual Adam is a site of nothingness with no narratives and no cultural references. Reading Jabez's poem today, I can hardly identify with Jabez's desire to mourn Adam's bare living as a testimony of his poverty. In contemporary Israeli culture, as this study shows, the Jewish textual tradition constitutes such a dense place of crowded, overwhelming references, names, images, symbols, and code, that it is possible to perceive Adam as the enviable free man, unburdened by history, myth, childhood, and inheritance, devoid of baggage. In life, of, in, in life in Citation, I tell the complicated story between about the relationship of a contemporary Adam, Israeli secular male, to biblical narratives and the tradition of textuality. The Zionist Adam has since been charged with the burden of paradigmatic weight of historical Jewish and Israeli life. The allegorical Adam, along with the other biblical patriarchs, occupied a privileged position of those who can carry the load of narration, masculinity, and national mythology. A privileged fancy constructed, constructed of cultural performance, this citationality can tell us about the signifying space of reiteration and, and that com continually produce and reproduce the Hebrew reader. Zionist ideology, biblical foundational narratives have subsumed within the historical master narrative of Zionist ideology, with its pogrom, Holocaust, diaspora, migrations, war, and scarcity, that they offer up this narrative as cultural sustenance. Hebrew being the national language helped make the Bible accessible and easily consumable, providing a shared logic and system of sign through which to generate meaning and respond to life. As, as important because of the privileged position of the Bible as sacred and casual, euphemistic and literal, the Hebrew language is able to camouflage the truth and perform under different covers, effect that explain the numbing effect of tzatetes and how it has become possible to live within and among them. The main objective of this biblical citationality as the word to reveal is performative, in the sense that it, it doesn't just seek to transmit its information, but performs a role through repetition of established discursive practices or ways of doing things. For Israelis, this role of belonging in a Zionist citizen, citizenry, achieving in the process a degree of aspirational homogeneity. Following Judith Butler's idea of doing gender, Israelis, I suggest, have been doing Bible at the unique intersection of modernity and nationalism and from within Jewish intertextual traditions of reading and writing. 
צטטת, citationality as a life condition, is a multi-layered system of references and meaning making. It, open, it opens a dynamic discursive space that assigns its reader a scripted way to live with text. It intends both to name and pathologize the condition of existence within this densely crowded biblical framework that, like Zizek capitalism, is so total and it makes its alternative unthinkable. It is important to underscore that my in, 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 that my intention here is not to underplay the, uh, the un astounding value of uh, and contribution of Bible and Jewish textuality. It is critical to acknowledge the magnitude, wisdom, and impact. The rich tradition of Jewish intertextual interpretation was a lifeline and core for Jewish diasporas across the millennium and occasion the intellectual trajectory of discourses and disciplines throughout uh, history. And yet, within the process of accelerated and excessive neo-national, neo-Zionist ideology, we can identify Tzatetet as a violent process that denies a reader's agency. So the number of example is indeed overwhelming if you open the, the, the website or if you look at the culture to see how the Bible, what role the Bible and the Bible industry play in contemporary Israeli culture. And I'll just uh, name few, Tanakh Beyachad 929 is a website named for number of chapters in the book of the Hebrew Bible. It is a, as a site post a new chapter daily, framed as a challenge for daily self-improvement akin to dieting or exercise. Site users can share links and discussion around the daily passage. The invitation to Torah Basalon, Torah in the Salon, builds on the imagined community of the Bible. The subject, the website subtext is that even uh, atheists, leftists, intellectuals, and queer people can be part of a discussion providing they follow the, gener the general indigenous Zionist script. The site promotes a Bible as, a word, as the world's best-selling book, as a global treasure of a shared origin story of all humanity, this is a quote. Users can so, uh, uh, also purchase individual verses, attaching their name and photo to a verse like a, a donor plaque as if tell me your verse and I will tell you who you are. Um, the, well, the, well, the website, I mean, this is the notion of secularism, it kind of collaborate with the Ministry for, of Education and Culture to initiate an international competition for children, for Bible, uh, scene, etc. Another site, Mikronet, is a huge secular uh, search engine for everything biblical with a specific section, Israeli speaks Tanakh, and also click, a bi click, click to be biblical. The Bible Marathon, another international foot race following the route taken by a messenger of the tribe of ben Benjamin. Michmanim is an ecological village in the Galilee that is accessible to Israelis through the teaching of the Bible on foot. Uh, uh, resi residing, eating, and breathing the narrative in the present uh, 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 there. I will give example of the way I worked with the notion of a land of milk and honey. The reading of a land of milk and honey articulates the sublime space of milk and honey in the Bible and the way it has been mythologized in Israeli discourse. I first interrogate the utterance of the land of milk and honey, a land flowing with milk and honey, within its representation for Moses through the burning bush in Exodus and the narrative of the 12 spies in Numbers. God's spectacle is communicated through the most performative language, a mighty goodness that is uttered in four words and unfolds a new logic, uh, in a new logic the poetic epistemi of, a, uh, of enduring provision, and in the present tense, the land flowing, continually flowing. Numerous examples from art, poetry, and eco-friendly industry of milk help me to trace the historical development of their vicissitude 
from the Bible to various Zionist manifestation. So I draw on the boundaries of this citational cosmology showing how the discourse of milk and honey has been mobilized as a cultural elixir of the nation. So um, for example, Shoshana Shababu, I, I, I have a whole study of Tnuva as, a, a, as an institution of milk and what does it mean for Israelis to drink milk is to become a, actually to, to, to belong to the land through milk with images of Diane sings drinking milk as the, the male, ultimate male a, 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 a drinker. Um, Shoshana Shababu uh, talking about Vash, honey brings together the saturated site of bee house and honeymoon with Zalman and Mazal. I'm kind of emphasizing the Z in the beehive that uh, are humming a sticky music, grotesque noise of bees and honey. Kind of real critique of what, what it means to, uh, to live in the, the, the landscape of bee, bees and a uh, land of uh, milk and honey. Uh, more extreme, in Adama Meshuga at Sweet Ma, Dor Shaul uh, a film in 2006, Mill became intoxicating fluid where Avraham, the kibbutz uh, secretary, perversely per sucks directly from the udder of the cow. With no dim distance, he is indeed intoxicated by the laws of sexual proximity to the body of milk. Working on the sacrifice, I conclude, and I'm moving from one to the other, just to give a, a sense. Um, I conclude that the real victim of Genesis is neither Abraham, as Jewish tradition and philosophy have maintained, nor Isaac, as the young generation of post-Holocaust Hebrew writers have opined, no Sarah, as recent feminists claim, nor even the Ram, as the poet Yehuda Michai suggests, but rather the victim of the Ma'achelet and the sacrifice is the modern Hebrew reader, especially the Sabra native. Reading here is a domain of the debt economy, a demand of the text as it is circulated and imagined. It is imperative to internalize and identify with its message uh, of obedience and read the text as if we are closely implicated, whether as Abraham or his son. Reading from an ideological saturated position implicates the reader of the story within the textual matrix of its genealogy and the eternally surviving offspring of culture, of Jewish culture. To the extent that we can set a new slide of vulnerability, not of victimhood, but of vulnerability, it is the Mizrahi Arab Jewish reader and female and masculine whose voice in these works is the most urgent pointing for a pressing cry to rethink old intertext and their imperatives. For El Kayam, the Ma'achelet eh, eh, Abraham slaughtering knife become a female mouth that cuts through intense interrogation the love of the Ma'achelet, why me? Mizrahim are the perfect consumer of the Zionist narrative. And I can say on, uh, personally that I was mourning uh, uh, during my army days, I was mourning, devouring memory, different kind of mourning, not like now. Um, in the mel collective melancholy uh, climate of Israel of the time, devouring memory books of de dead soldiers and reading Holocaust literature, I couldn't get enough. My psychic empathy as a reader in the language of Nicholas Abraham uh, entered the collective phantom with utmost patriotism and alt uh, uh, altruism. This resembled the protagonist in Udi Sharabani's short story, Those Who Need to Enter, Enter. Uh, full disclosure, he's a family member. Sharabani, a uh, protagonist, embodies the emblematic archive of this cosmogony. He's a walking accumulated narrative kleptomaniac who indiscriminately keeps every scrap of his life into his seemingly infinite pockets. 
he is anxious to keep it all, preserve it, protect it, make it part of his body until the day when, as Sharabani writes, everything came out of his pocket. His thoughts fell out like papers that went through the laundry that were kept forgotten in the pockets, crumbled, crumbling, letters that spread the, on the paper, letters that now came out of the lines of the page, even if he did not want that, even if he made effort to write between the lines. Against the mythological of milk and honey and their provisional aspirations, Eli Bachar, a brilliant Mizrahi poet, makes a new radical request. Forty days before his death, he asked for ochel meduyak, exact, precise food. This demand for a new economy seeks to draw new ethical limits to language and its symbolic scape, a way to trim the excess extraneous meaning of textuality and reverse the condition of tzatetet. Ethnographing, ethno-reading, a concept that I developed in my previous book, is about the ethics of reading the others. It is a methodology of reading that seeks to expand the contextual framework of representation, to engage deeply and intimately with the social, political, and poetic mechanism that have produced the knowledge about the other. It provides new opportunities to increase audibility and visibility in text and otherwise remain unavailable. At the same time, it also alerts us to the hidden violence that has been silenced and normalized. For example, the way we read Genesis has muted the sound of tears, laughter, or torture of women. But we should ask, what is the value of Sarah laughter? I mean, how can we listen to it? If we do, once we do, we can perhaps perceive uh, her laughter as an expression of her present. Sarah laughs. With this laughter, she says, Hineni, I'm here. Not through language like Abraham, but through laughter. The reality of intertextuality in biblical practices as practices today, as practice today lead to a distorted sense of hyper-referentiality. If we engage in developing methods of reading with attention to semiotic and language of subjectivity and position of agency, moving away from binarism and dichotomies, avoid making text and intertext into synonyms, and reading as if, we are, will slowly start to declutter the mind, gradually lifting these layers upon layers of signification. In so doing, we may be able to achieve a measure of emancipation and decolonization from this unique context in which hegemony is inextricable from national narrative and belonging from religion performance and belonging from religious performance. Belonging is, belonging, belonging is foregone. Here we are, Hinenu. Maybe now we can move to Hannah and Nomi. Thank you. Thank you so, so much uh, for this. Um, maybe I can start by uh, pointing out um, something that became very clear during uh, your presentation, <clears throat> that um, in your beautiful book, you, you create kind of a, a subtle connection between this condition or disease of cetacianitis, satetit, uh, and food, right? You start with um, uh, a kid and its mother's milk and the land of milk and honey of which you gave us a taste. Um, and you end with um, the, um, the whole loaf, the pachlema, the, uh, and, and, the, and the whole pita. The, the whole loaf in, in Agnon and in the Book of Ruth to begin with, and uh, the whole pita in uh, Palestinian uh, literature, and especially in the work of Elias Khoury. So um, could you, you know, since this really brings together your literary scholar and your ethnographer, right, uh, the textuality, intertextuality, and the food study, um, Tell us more about how food uh, becomes a site where you can read this obsession with 
citation. Thank Why Dafka food? Yeah, thank you. I think the, 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 when I, I start working on the subject, uh, it was overwhelming to see the, the role that the verb achal, to eat, and the same root for food, ochel, uh, plays in uh, these foundational narratives. Uh, from especially in Genesis, in the, the, the going back to the, 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 to the story, the creation story and Sarah uh, and Eve as the, 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 the mouth that eats and the mouth that is associated with knowledge kind of immediately connect the two. So knowledge is articulated through the mouth, the mouth that speak, but then the mouth that eat, but also uh, uh, the, the ma'achelet and the, the snare that is not ukal, the, the unconsumable uh, burning bush, the ma'achelet, the slaughtering knife, and an uh, uh, and are all from the same root. And I, I start to see how, what, what the, the, how they work together. And this was very much connected to Eretz Zavad Chalav and a, a land that devours its people. But in Hebrew, devour is ochelet, the same verb of eating. So consuming and eating are very much connected. And so at the time, I was so struck by this connection and working with post-colonial work, I was like, this is about cannibal, the, the ideology as cannibalizing force that articulated through roots and through the meaning uh, that, uh, that, that they provide. But okay. how come food and the slaughtering knife together, which is not that uncommon in culture to see contradiction and formation of language, but at the same time, I was very interested in where, where food becomes uh, intoxicating, when milk becomes the, the place of death, when a, a land that is, is flung with mil milk and honey and is the most promising land uh, becomes a devouring that leaves no trace, nothing, right, in that uh, context. And um, from then on, I, I was very, it was very easy for me to see references in the culture, like the Kurzweil idea that uh, it's not like Adorno's expression that to write a, a poem after Auschwitz is a barbaric act, is that to have a feast after a, a, a meal after Auschwitz is a barbaric act. And that's why he explained on, a, a Agnon, who said, oh, I wrote a, a, almost 300 pages about Hasidic tales, but I provided only a parity, a, a, a appetizer. And so for Kurzweil, I say, appetizers are the only things that we can eat after Auschwitz, right? So again, narratives and food were very much connected. And with this idea of Kemach without flour, you don't have Torah and you don't have Torah without flour kind of. So uh, I, I, th I think there is a place in which they are both working, especially when I took it later to the idea of hunger and total satiation and total devastating hunger in the Book of Fruit and that mobilized the narrative and overfeeding where we are all overstaffed and right, not just being eaten, but a, 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 unable to survive from too much food. So, so this, this paradigm became really a prism for me to look at the question of citationality. Maybe there are other verbs like that, maybe there are, but this is what I saw in the process that I went through. Nomi, you wanna? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, the problem with going second is that Hannah kind of said a little bit of what I wanted to say. I mean, I think one of the most amazing things about your work right now is how um, it brought together um, the two different parts of your life in Berkeley, you were split between those of us studying literature and the anthropologists. And um, it, this is like the late eighties, the nineties in Berkeley. It was really all about words and the text. It was all about intertextuality and illusions. And what you were doing in the anthropology department, the stains of culture, right? Menstruation, it just seemed such a world apart. Um, and in this book, 
the idea that the close reading that was our religion um, in, in the comp lit department is the fact that that's somehow connected with the body and what comes out of it and what goes into it is so powerful and so um, illuminating. Um, and I just want to, I realize that that's not quite my question, but I am getting there. <laughs> but um, thank you. This is good. good. I, I like how you you put it together with with special, you know, along different disciplines and, and, and kind of become more multidisciplinary project. Right. And that somehow this, so, so the Bible, which seems as if it's about whatever, all of our ancestors, also when it, when it becomes the food or the disease, when it's translated into the body of um, you know, the people, the secular Jews of the state of Israel, that that somehow becomes a, a, a mode of exclusion and inclusion and um, asserting a certain kind of Ashkenazi dominance. Um, I'm really curious to hear you talk about that more, but I wonder if we could focus for a minute on what's actually a footnote in your book that broke my heart, um, which is a footnote about your own name. Um, Chana also read that footnote, um, which of course is very meaningful to me because my own name is related to your name. Um, and I was named Nomi in, you know, in the diaspora, not in the land of Israel, but for Orthodox Jews to name their daughter Naomi, there, it wasn't a real Orthodox name. It was a kind of Zionist gesture. What you say is that this name was actually chosen for you by a, an Ashkenazi nurse in the hospital who your mother didn't quite know what to name you, it sounds like. You didn't have a, an Iraqi name. You were given a, a Zionist name. So was I in the diaspora. Um, and technically, I guess, we're related in some way through the Bible, through this very intense friendship slash kinship, but also distinguished by diaspora in the land of Israel, by my Orthodox roots and your secular upbringing, by my being Ashkenazi and your being Mizrahi. I'm just wondering, um, you know, if you could talk a little bit about what it means to have the name Ruth or Ruti, as I always knew you, um, and how that is about the inscription of the Bible onto your body. You can see why I care a lot about your answer to this question. Um, well, okay, the three of us have biblical names, so it's really very fulfilling. <laughs> the, the, Mine the, is, okay. is after uh, my grandmother who was murdered in the Shoah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and so, so, yeah, there is intimacy in name that is really very, uh, that's what you done, right? But at the same time, this critique of name as intertext. Uh, the used, reused, recycled, secondhand, right? Ex uh, uh, adjectives about names really put names in different perspective. Um, I think as a Sabra in Israel, there was a lot of feeling of innovation in being Sabra, the first child in the family, but also having a Hebrew name, right? Um, I don't know if my mother didn't have a name and I don't know, I don't want to develop the narrative around it. I know that whatever this name means to me led me to write about it and very engage in this kind of naming and biblical practices as part. I'm a product of it and attentive to the possibilities of what names do to us, right? How, how names are also part. Are they a, an, an expression of incredible richness of culture with all the, the, the things that we carry and we, we are proud of and privileged? Are they, are they like used newspapers that we wrap old fish or preserve? I don't want to, to sound terrible, but if it's old and recycled and secondhand, I see kind of, this is, this is kind of an expression of hunger. And, and how they both work in the culture and to, to bring this dialectic is important because that's how we can exp expand our understanding of what, what does it mean to, to give names and to think about it as a practice. It was very 
coming to Israel was an, an incredible elation for my family. This was like the massive wave of immigration of Baghdadi and Jews. And naming was part of the whole spirit and the aspiration of becoming and belonging. And I think this is the idea that belonging or the desire to belong and the identification with sites of belonging carry with that a certain kind of price or toll in cultural, in, in, in the collective consciousness. Um, and of course was not originally Jewish, so that belonging is so... Right, exactly. But it's that... about conversion. It's about converting the newcomer. And in that sense, the name of fruit, like the book of fruit is about return. So it's about coming and returning to Zion. And, and kind of, I don't know to what extent there is a consciousness around it, but this idea of converting the newcomers into uh, indigenous uh, Israelis, right? This is, this is the whole Zionist mechanism. So it's very easily manifested in names. And uh, yeah, I wanted to add on that uh, point, uh, you don't go into it in great detail, but um, let me read one sentence and see if you uh, want to get into this delicate issue. Uh, you write that the citi biblical citationitis uh, is used <clears throat> as providing political claim of historical ownership, justifying territorial gain and lasting presence. Um, did you see that in your research as changing over time? Um, I know that when I was growing up in Israel, the book of Joshua all of a sudden became the major book to memorize, uh, something that traditional Jewish intertextual research had absolutely no use for, uh, you know, just like Sam Samson was very far from being a gibor, a hero. So um, can you say some more about that? Esther? Can I just add to that? Because I don't think I'll have time for a second question, but if I can just say that, um, it strikes me that one of the historical developments that Khan is talking about is the growing glamour of the Talmud as opposed to the, the Bible in the last um, 25 years or so, so. Um, thank you, it's a good question. I think, um, wow, what shall I say? There is a clear intensification of tzatetet in Israeli culture. And I think there is a, a, a clear, a, that, that connect to identity politics and to all kinds of political claims, not just ethnic politics or, but religious politics question about uh, what does it mean to be intellectual? What does it mean to be leftist? What does it mean to be critical? All kinds of questions that are uh, uh, reverberating in the culture and, and, and uh, in a very chaotic and, and, and there is no real direction how to even start to unpack it. I think we need to distinguish between popular discourse and intellectual, more intellectual discourse among secular a pop, in the popular discourse, I think the Bible is a, a still a very important reference and provides this kind of, a, a, more than the Talmud, but among certain scholars and among certain kind of students, and there is a more interest in the Talmud, but I'm not, I, I, I didn't study it and I, I cannot say. As a, about the claims that, that they become political claims and how the 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 it becomes a, a, it's it's like the 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 contested what is truth how how do we think about truth it's like bring me your your verse and I will tell you if you can argue with me because this is the claim, you know? This is when Ezra came from uh, Babylon and he bring a list of all the people and the gold and the, not only Cyrus, but also God given and, and the, the scribe and everything is written like the level of um, legitimacy that texts have uh, within the Bible 
to produce different political claims is, is, is really astonishing. And it, it, we see it in the West Bank, but we also see it among other scholars in different contexts. So, and it's a degree, it's not yes or no. It's it's question of how, how different people choose to engage in biblical practices or in doing Bible from reading the book of Ruth on, on Shavuot or which became just now like a huge enterprise in, in the holiday and all day and all night or reading the, the Megillah the, 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 of Esther in Purim, etc., etc. Um, did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, it's not just an issue of personal uh, use, uh, but the way in which it's used in state politics totally. and to it justify the yeah, yeah. You know, occup continued occupation of Palestinian yeah. land. I, I didn't get there, but of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the rhetoric, the, the, the public rhetoric discourse is, is so saturated by these and use it to, to promote a certain kind of collective sentiment that is very difficult to challenge because it has such a powerful uh, impact. Mm -hmm. And uh, it always wins, right? You use the Bible and this is that, that's it. That's the final word in, in every discussion. So, it's very difficult to negotiate with it. Uh, maybe we'll move to open up the Q&A that's out there. Is that okay? Yes. So um, I just want to encourage everybody. We I got uh, two questions, one uh, a really specific one and one uh, a, a broader one. And we, I think we definitely have time for three or four. So go ahead and, and put your questions in the Q and A. Um, maybe I'll say to both of them to you right now, so you can decide what order to answer them. So um, the first question was about um, the writer Mayor Shalev. If I actually the question seems to have disappeared. I think I I'm remembering right. Um, and how you see the function of um, ah. Also, you have been, uh, people are thanking you for a fascinating lecture. And um, so how do you read Mayor Sholev in the context of Tzatetet, this disease? Does he have it worse or better than everyone? And I'm, I'm curious to know what that person has in mind, if they want to say a little more. I have an idea, but I'm not 100% sure. And why don't I throw in the, the broader question too, in case it ends up being a question you can answer together. And the broader question was um, um, in the, whether you can discuss this practice of tzatetet in the, um, in the context of the changing relationships and tensions between the religious and the secular um, communities in Israel today, um, or, or did you just think, as opposed to just thinking about this as a purely secular practice? Um, about Meir Shalev, uh, I have a whole section of different examples of uh, uh, writing and different projects that writers, artists, and uh, filmmakers uh, uh, um, did in the last, especially in the last uh, 40 years, uh, and, and new works, not just one uh, uh, the kind of really evolving, very dynamic uh, space for children books and films and uh, engaging children in a website with different kind of material. So yeah, definitely Meir Shalev's work is very important. And uh, I think I think he's uh, 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 working on this uh, 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 theme of how to negotiate in more interpretive practices rather than take them and put them on a face volume in, in the culture. And I think we can put all the writers, all this list of writers from Hayudim Ba'im and Eretz Naederet and all kind of jokes and that on, on a scale 
of different engagement and developing practices that are more attentive to different minority groups or by women or how to think about it from a perspective of a, 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 a gender, male gender or a, a, even from the perspective of uh, non-Jews. So uh, of course, this is very much part of the dynamic process of doing and undoing biblical narratives. Um, as for the religious and non-religious, I think I, I, I wrote about it, the fascinating intersection uh, of, uh, uh, of the ideology and how Ben-Gurion at the time and the, 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 the way the Bible has become part of the national institution in Israeli culture entering into the classroom. Um, and classroom is amazing, fascinating example because if we talk about intertext and we talk about the use of intertext in the classroom, the classroom is the forefront of a, a, a appropriation of Israeli becoming. And you can say that as the way I grew up in Israel in these schools, that the classroom was an intertext. It became an intersect it's itself of this institution and the way that we relied so much on previous models or specific models to, to, to become the, the perfect reader, the perfect Hebrew reader, the perfect Sabra, the perfect Zionist Sabra who can sing Eretz Zavat Chalavud Vash with the legs even before you read it in, in school. As a, as a in the kindergarten, as a dance, as a, as a something that you feel in your mouth. So, so in that sense, I was very interested in it. I, I didn't do religious, I, I, this is not my area and I cannot claim that this is something I, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm definitely more interested, but I don't have access to it in, in a way that I can be a scholar of that, the religious, how the religious community use. I have ideas. I, I think the, the situation in the settlement and in the West Bank is really scary. Um, the, 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 um, the, the way that following, following in, 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 in the most abstract, what does it mean to follow uh, the, the, the rabbi? What does it mean to follow certain kind of religion, religious practices? who is the model, all kind of questions like that are very critical in this moment. And I don't think any leadership deals with them uh, in, in, in a way that is constructive and can lead to any kind of illumination or understanding better of what is happening. So Ruti, I, um, unless Hannah wants to br br jump in, I, I, we still have a minute or two or seven so I'm going to take the prerogative to ask you a certain another question, if that's okay. So I had a student at the GTU, the Center for Jewish Studies of the Graduate Theological Union, which is one of the co-sponsors of your talk. Um, I think she graduated. She's a Palestinian Christian who said that um, for Palestinian Christians, um, many of them say the Old Testament doesn't do it for them. You know, they go to Jesus as their, for their spiritual, um, to, to do their intertextual work, let's say, um, to think about justice. But she particularly thought that it was important for Palestinian Christians to see the Hebrew Bible as theirs too. Um, it was a really uh, powerful move she was making. Um, and she talked about the prophets and their, um, fight against certain kinds of land appropriation. I forget which prophets she, she was talking about. Um, and to fight against the idea that, that the Hebrew Bible was a kind of real estate, a real estate contract for the Jewish people, between the Jewish people and God. Um, and I'm wondering whether what you're recommending, and the two of you are, are doing such interesting parallel work that right. I should figure out how to introduce you. But I'm wondering whether what you would say is, yes, go ahead, use the Bible, find your backward, marginal, subversive role in it, or just close that book, 
goodbye. I mean, which is one of the things a character in a Mary Sherlev novel says, right? So um, which one? I mean, is it enough with the Bible already? Or is it that the Bible has tools for its own deconstruction? It's a very important question. I was working today on the book of fruit. I thought you will ask me about it. And I, I, I looked I at- I think it. about it all the time, but sorry. And, and I taught it recently. And in the book of fruit, there is an incredible moment. Like I put it, I read it along the book of, uh, of Genesis, the story of Moab, to make sure that Ruth is situated within her own history, right? This is a situated reading that I uh, uh, understood. And the, the idea of Ruth as a, um, so, so whatever she did with Naomi and all these boys comes to her and say, uh, your uh, uh, compensation should be mushlam, uh, perfect, because, and maskurtech shlema, like he tells it in three words, a, a huge, huge uh, acknowledgement for what she did. And Ruth eat the bread that he made her. But before that, she tells him, Nihamtani, you, you, you comforted me. And, and, and then I show in the chapter that he gave her the bread, she ate, she had her fill and she left over, she had left over to give to Nomi. So the term of hunger of Nomi, of Ruth is resolved. She's not the hungry person anymore. And for all of us, knowing how a trauma is so difficult to resolve, we understand, okay, the Bible resolved the trauma through this magical bread of uh, 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 Boaz, along with the other seeds, right? Not just the seed of the, the barley, but also the seed semen, right? That in Hebrew, it's the same. But it is this idea that he acknowledged her uh, he acknowledged her history. And I was like, oh my God, I didn't see it before today. I say, it's about his acknowledgement. He acknowledged her history in a way, in a total full <laughs> way with the uh, uh, invocation of God. And I was thinking, what will happen if we, this will, for us, it's like, uh, 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 if we need to read it differently, of course, right? This is it. And looking from root, from within, intimate at all this, say, this is how you do trauma resolution and healing. You acknowledge fully. What if we will apologize? What if this acknowledgement is an apology? How we can start to resolve other issues? So I don't think I want to close the Bible. I think. I want to open it again and again, but never to close the, the, the possibilities, the allegorical possibilities or to limit the economic, the economy of metaphor. So there, are, there is more possibilities there. And I thought this idea that maybe Boaz acknowledgement of her pain by these and the bread and the semen is this is how you solve the trauma. We don't have any clue from other sources. So yeah. for me, it was like a, a moment to say, an acknowledgement is about apology. We need to learn to apologize politically. We need to apologize in the context of claiming uh, territories and in the, the context of nations, even like Moab, who cares about Moab? Uh, no one think about Moab as someone, but to bring all these nations because the pain of others is so normalized, how to start to pay attention to it. And in that context, like to, so I cannot say to close the Bible. I still, I'm fascinated by it. And I myself doing Bible to a certain extent and product of this culture. But I think this is the process. This is the challenge of how to, to mm -hmm. develop the critical skills. That's really beautiful. Let me just uh, add, I know that we're almost out of time, but um, this is precisely why uh, the way in which you, you read Yehuda Amichai's take on Ruth is so important because as, as you say, and as you quote, uh, otherness killed Ruth. Uh, so 
he brings together the Ruth of the Bible with his childhood love who was killed in the camps. Um, and it's this correction, this healing of acknowledgement that you talk about today that is just so moving. And thank you so much for that. Thank you about the opportunity to talk about my book in this climate when there is so much happening. And I really appreciate all the viewers there that I cannot see, but that made the time, even in Israel, in crazy hours. And uh, thank you, Naomi and Hannah, you're in my heart. Thank and you. And mine.